The title of this morning's lesson is a very simple one. It's a question. The question is, can one fall from grace? Can one fall from grace? And of course, this is answered no by vast numbers of people throughout the world. So many people follow various religious teachings that say one can never fall from grace. One can never lose their salvation. One can never forfeit eternal life. But the only way to answer that reliably and accurately is to look very diligently and closely at what God's Word says about it. And since we are living in the Christian age and we are governed by the New Testament, then we need to look at the New Testament for our answers to that question. The first thing that we want to look at is that the New Testament says that there is a danger of apostasy. There is a danger of losing one's salvation. There's a danger of falling from grace. That possibility exists. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he is using some examples to teach a lesson to the church there. The church at Corinth had all kinds of problems. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we want to look at verses 11 and 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes to these Christians, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He had just mentioned in the prior verses about several different ones who had fallen in the wilderness. He uses that to teach a lesson for those in the New Testament. He says, those examples were written for our admonition. He says, there's a point to those. He says, just like they fell, he says, it is possible for you, he's writing to Christians in Corinth, not unbelievers, Christians, he says, it is possible for you to fall. That should be enough to stop the lesson, shouldn't it? That should be enough for anybody to understand it is possible for one to fall from grace. Going along with that, using similar phrases, when Paul wrote to the churches in the area of Galatia, <clears throat> In verse 4 of chapter 5, Paul writes to these Christians. He says, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Who were these people? These were Christians. He says, You're estranged from Christ. You can't be estranged from Christ unless you were with Christ to begin with. He says, now you're estranged from Christ. You are fallen from grace. And again, isn't that enough to prove to the world that's it? Unfortunately, so many people go back to John chapter 10, where Jesus is talking about his sheep, and he says, no one can snatch you out of my hands. I've heard so many people in the religious world say, well, that shows that you can't lose your salvation. No, it doesn't. That shows that no one can take it from you. And that's exactly true. No one can take my salvation from me. No one can take eternal life from me. No one can do that. The devil doesn't even have the power to snatch that away. But I have the power to do it. I can lose it. But if I do, it's not because someone took it from me or snatched it. It is my own fault. And so people in the religious world completely abuse those two verses in John chapter 10. No, people cannot snatch it from you, but yes, you can lose it by what you choose to do in this life. 
three passages in the book of Hebrews all have to do with losing one's salvation, with falling from grace. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 3, move to chapter 6, and end in chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 3, and again, this book also written to Christians, much of the book is to help them to keep from falling from grace. In Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, the writer says, Beware, brethren. All right, he's not talking to unbelievers here. He's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians, disciples of Christ. He says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in, notice that ing word, departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. I don't think those three verses could be any clearer. It's a warning. It's a warning, right? Be with Because it's possible to depart from the living God. These people are with the living God. He says it's possible for some of them to depart from the living God. Isn't that what he says? It's possible to depart from the living God. He says to ensure, to encourage people not to depart from the living God, then we have a responsibility, a duty, an obligation to do what? Exhort people. Why, if there's no possibility of, of falling from grace, there's no reason to exhort people not to. That would be a waste of time. But he says, you exhort one another daily. See, you can lose it in one day. That's why you exhort each other daily. He doesn't say exhort each other weekly or monthly. You can lose it in a day. So he says, exhort one another daily. While you have time, because sin is deceitful. And he says, for we've become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You mean it's possible not to hold it steadfast? Obviously, because the word if is there. We lose it. No one can take it from us, but we can lose it. If we aren't steadfast, to the end. The writer goes on in Hebrews chapter 6, <clears throat> beginning in verse 4, the Hebrew writer says this, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Notice what these people had done. They had tasted of the heavenly gift. They had tasted of it. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. And he says, if they fall away, he says there's a warning here that you can fall. That you can fall away. You can lose it. You can lose that wonderful eternal life, that precious gift. Not because someone snatched it out of your hands, but because you lost it yourself by the decisions you make. It's not about losing some great reward. So many think that, well, this is, you can't lose eternal life, but you can use your reward. Well, how ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that idea? It's not what he says at all. Well, the Hebrew writer once again touches on this in the 10th chapter. He begins in verse 26 by saying this, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy 
who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. Notice, notice, the covenant by which he was sanctified. This person had been sanctified. He had been set apart as a Christian. He had been saved. But he says, this person will receive worse punishment if he goes back and tramples the Son of God, counts his blood as a common thing, insults the Spirit of grace. This person was saved. This person was on the road to heaven. But this person chose... No one forced him. No one snatched it out of his hand. But this person chose to trample the Son of God. He had been sanctified. He had been saved. His sins had been washed away. He had been forgiven. And then he chose to give that up. He had received the knowledge of the truth. He knew it. He had accepted it. He had obeyed it. He had been sanctified. Skipping down to verse 37. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. People can draw back. People can fall from grace, people can lose that wonderful eternal gift. It is not something that someone can snatch from you, but it's something that you can lose by your decisions. By the decisions you make, you can lose it. One that we talked about recently on Wednesday night, in Second Peter chapter 2. We also see the danger of apostasy as Peter talks about it in verse 20 through 22, verses 20 through 22 of 2 Peter 2, he writes, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed who were wallowing in the mire. These people had escaped. Their sins had been washed away. They had been forgiven. But they go back and are again entangled in sin in those pollutions. He says, they can become entangled again. They had escaped it. They had received eternal life. No one took it from them. They made a decision to go back to the dirt, the pollution, the mud, the sin. The danger of apostasy is very, very real. The second thing we see from the New Testament is that there are several examples of people who did that very thing. They fell from grace. They lost their salvation. They lost eternal life because of decisions they made. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They were Christians. The Bible is very clear about that. They were Christians. What did they do? They lied to the Holy Spirit and, of course, lost their lives. All it takes is that one example to disprove the fact that you can't lose your salvation. They did. What about the one we call Simon the Sorcerer? Second Peter, or Acts chapter 8. Let's go there now. Acts chapter 8 and read about that case. People try and, and twist Acts chapter 8, but it's so straightforward. This is a long reading, but very important. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 13. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Here's Simon. 
He was lost, but now he's saved. He believed and was baptized. According to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he was forgiven of his sins. He was saved. He was given eternal life. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answers, and pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. He was lost, and then he was saved, and then he was lost again. Simon had forfeited his salvation and was in danger, according to Peter. He says, you have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart is not right. It was right because he believed and was baptized and was counted as a Christian. So he needed to repent or he would be lost. He forfeited his salvation because of his wickedness. He forfeited it. Many other examples could be given if we had time. But the third thing, and certainly a very important one, is what are the results of someone who falls from grace? Someone who leaves the faith, who falls into apostasy. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, the following. Matthew chapter 13, in one of the lessons Jesus teaches about the day of judgment, Verses 40 and 41 of Matthew 13, these are the words of Jesus. And he says, beginning actually in verse 40, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then, this will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Be gathered out of the kingdom, burned, thrown into the fire. In John 15, again, Jesus teaches the possibility of losing one's salvation. John chapter 15. This is the chapter, of course, that talks about Jesus being the vine and the disciples being the branches. And in John 15, verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they will gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Notice, these people were abiding in Christ. They were in Christ. They had believed, they had obeyed, they had been baptized, they were Christians. But they had to do something. They had to abide in Christ. That was their responsibility. That was their part. They had to abide in Christ. No one comes up and snatches them, cuts them off from Christ. No one has the power to do that. But they had the power to leave the vine. They had the power to choose not to abide in the vine, not to abide in Christ anymore. That's why he tells them, if anyone does not abide in me. They were abiding and they choose by their actions not to. Can people not remain attached to Christ? They don't have to remain attached to Him. No one can snatch it from them, but they can give it up 
And he says, the answer to that is, they will be cast into the fire and burned. That's what will happen. And finally, in Revelation chapter 3, John reinforces the words of Christ. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. This is to the angel of the church in Sardis. Verse 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Whose names are written in the book of life? Those who are saved, those who have eternal life. But some people say, your, your name can't be blotted out of that. Well, yes, it can. Because Jesus says, if you overcome, your name will not be blotted out. That verse, if it teaches anything, teaches that a person's name can be blotted out of the book of life. The only people allowed entrance into heaven are those written in the book of life. Therefore, people can lose that right. They can lose eternal life. They can lose, they can forfeit their salvation. Not because someone took it from them, but because by their actions, they forfeit it. They give it up. Toward the end of Revelation, we see again the book of life. In Revelation chapter 20, we see the great judgment scene. And in verse 15 of that book, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life, your name can be blotted out of it, erased, taken out. It's in there and it's, then it's removed. God's word is clear. A child of God can indeed fall from grace. Therefore, it's imperative that we take heed to these warnings throughout the New Testament. Watch and pray. Obey. So we won't fall from grace. Because it's a very real possibility. One must first become a child of God as those did in the first century. After hearing the word, what did they do? They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the true Savior, the Son of God. That belief led them to repent, place their hands in Him, in, in, place their lives in His hands, turn away from their past lives, confess His name before men and have their sins washed away in immersion. But then they were told that if they continue to confess their sins, that God was faithful and just to forgive their sins. And that's what we must do. This morning, if there's a need in your heart to answer this invitation, then we encourage you to do that as David leads us in this invitation song. Let us stand, please.